Hi, everybody. You're in the right place for the Climate is Local webcast, Zoning Out Fossil Fuels. I'm Ann Pernick. I'm with Stand, and all of our presenters are here uh, waiting in the wings, eager to talk with you. Thank you all for being here, and thanks to the presenters for all the time they've put in um, to this and getting ready to share this work and hear about your work, too. I'm just going to take us through a couple logistics things, and then um, I will do brief bios on our presenters, and then, uh, then we'll get into it. This webinar is being recorded for posting online. Everyone is in listen-only mode to begin, except for the presenters. And we are really excited to make this very interactive today. After the presentations, we're gonna have a Q&A and discussion. And there are two ways to participate in that. We would love to see and hear you. If you're okay being seen and heard today, we can pull up your audio and video. Um, so if you have a question and you're okay being seen and heard, um, please put your question in the questions tab. If you'd rather ask it anonymously, drop it in the chat and we will try to get to those too. Um, and um, if we are running short on time, we may combine questions or just give, uh, I may offer the questions on your behalf um, if we have too many questions to get to otherwise. And um, in the unlikely event that we lose our connection, something goes wrong with our system, we do have a conference line system that we can move to that's only in the event of an emergency. If you get bumped off, check your own connection or your own phone line first, just try to come back in, that usually solves it. But if there's a big problem, we, have, um, we do have that uh, conference line system. And the, these numbers are in the email that went out to everybody about an hour ago. So you don't have to, don't have to worry about writing that down. Just going to take you through this one more time. I'm Ann. I'm with Stand Out Earth. You're in the right place for the Climate is Local Zoning Out Fossil Fuels webcast. This webinar is being recorded for posting online. Everyone is in listen-only mode to begin. Please use the Q&A tab to ask questions if you're okay being seen and heard today. If you'd rather be anonymous, uh, drop your question in the chat. We'll call on everybody we can, um, but if we have to combine questions to save time or if I need to ask questions to save time, we'll do that. And in the unlikely case we lose our connection, we do have a conference line to go to, but check and see if it's a problem with your own connection um, first. That usually solves it. And so with that, I'm going to um, introduce our, our presenters and then um, turn it over to Matt Krog, who will um, take us through uh, facilitating this webcast. So Matt Krogh is our Extreme Oil Campaign Director at Stand Out Earth. Matt has been working with Stand since 2013 to direct a campaign targeting tar sands and other extreme oil on the west coast of North America. Under Matt's leadership, Stand has formed and grown a crude awakening network which is composed of two, more than 250 organizations operating nationally to delay or halt new oil infrastructure projects. Before joining Stand, Matt co-founded the Power Pass Coal Coalition and spent over three years fighting the Gateway Pacific and other proposed coal terminals in Washington and Oregon. And Matt, thank you so much for being on our team today. We are also <laughs> we are also very pleased to have Barry Buchanan. He's chair of the Whatcom County Council. And in August of last year, Barry introduced an emergency moratorium to temporarily block applications for any projects that could enable unrefined fossil fuel export from Cherry Point. And since that time, Barry has led the way to develop permanent policies and land use rules to protect both jobs and the environment. And Barry, thank you so much for being with us today. And we have Daphne Weisham from the Center for Sustainable Economy. Daphne leads CSE's Climate Justice Program, a founder and director of the of the Sustainable Energy and Economy Network in 1996. Daphne has worked for several decades on research and advocacy at the intersection of climate change, human rights, fossil fuels, international finance, carbon markets, and sustainable economies. Her pathbreaking research and advocacy has resulted in shifts in public policy and investment at the national and international level. Daphne, thank you so much for being with us. And we also are so pleased to have Nick Caleb from the Center for Sustainable Economy. Um, on, he's on the team with Daphne there. Nick is staff attorney there, providing legal counsel for the Climate Justice Program. Nick is active locally in Portland, Oregon. Shout out to Portland. We have a lot of Portland folks today. <laughs> Portland, Oregon policymaking with a particular focus on environmental justice, sustainable cities, and issues around the commons. Nick graduated with an LLM from Tilburg University in the Netherlands after receiving a JD from the University of Oregon School of Law. So thank you again to all of our presenters. What a great team. And thank you to our audience members. 
And um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Matt. And um, Matt, give me a second to um, pull up your slides and uh, we can really get going. Or actually, I think you're gonna share your own slides if that works, but I've got them yep. if we need them. Okie doke, uh, let's see, there we go. And pull this up. Awesome. Um, Howdy, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Matt Krogh. I'm the Extreme Oil Campaign Director um, at Stand.Earth, where we work on forests, corporate responsibility, uh, and climate. And on the climate front, we've worked hard to prevent the expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure, including things like oil training facilities and pipelines, both in the US and Canada. Uh, and part of that work has been growing what uh, Anne called the Crude Awakening Network to over 200 groups, almost 300 now, to share best practices around fighting fossil fuel uh, infrastructure. Uh, today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about what we mean by climate as local and dive deep into a couple examples of how that really plays out. Um, you know, it's, it's a little more than half a year into the Trump administration, uh, and it's not unusual to despair about the ability to get real action on climate. Uh, but the truth is that for years, we've seen many failed attempts to get federal action at a really meaningful scale across the US, while simultaneously seeing real success when we take action uh, from a local perspective. And on an important note, uh, what we're talking about today, these land use ordinances, they're not preempted by federal powers. These are local decisions made with local powers and they can stick. Um, get to the next slide. Uh, in this picture, what we see are members of the Lummi Indian Nation. Uh, they're shown taking a successful stand against North America's largest proposed coal terminal. But their example is really a rare one where federal decision actually stopped the project. And at the state level, there are some examples, also rare, like Georgia, where a newly passed eminent domain law uh, effectively prevented the construction of a gas pipeline. But many of the successful opposition efforts we've seen um, have come where local jurisdictions held permitting power and chose to reject a land use permit for a project. Uh, there's an excellent article by Zara Hirji of Inside Climate News uh, that names many of the fossil fuel infrastructure projects that were stopped uh, in, from mid-2016 and earlier, uh, largely by citizen action. Now, working with our elected representatives to employ the land use powers held by municipalities, that's where citizens acting locally can get laws passed that will prevent the expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, the examples of stopping permits for project proposals, that's what happens when citizens and governments work with laws that are already on the books. What we're talking about today in the climate is local concept is enacting new laws, uh, citizens working with city or county councils, these new laws that prevent new fossil fuel projects from being considered for land use permits uh, in the first place. So this is uh, actually one of my favorite pictures. It's thousands and thousands of petitions and signatures being uh, delivered to Barry Buchanan, who you're gonna hear from next. Um, on that, uh, but this map I want to draw your attention is 2015 week of action that we coordinate here at STAN. It's communities across the country where people are concerned, in particular about oil trains, but other fossil fuel infrastructure as well. And while those actions that they took in the week of action took a bunch of different forms, uh, they partly resulted in a couple hundred different municipal actions that you see here in a map. Uh, this map we put together with a group called Frack Tracker. And it shows over 200 municipal resolutions uh, put forward by community members and councils who are worried about the impact of growing fossil fuel infrastructure in their communities. These are folks who are also working on uh, intersecting issues like uh, immigrant rights, environmental justice, and race. And it's through our active networking, all these folks working together, that we've been able to connect and share on these issues and learn from each other how to fight back. A lot of these local fights don't happen in isolation. Um, but the thing to remember about this particular map, these are resolutions. A resolution is more of an opinion or a policy statement by one of these uh, uh, county or city councils. We are talking about passing binding laws through ordinances that uh, the, it could be the risk bonding that Daphne's talking about, it could be land use. And if implemented broadly, all these municipal land use ordinances together can prevent the growth of the whole fossil fuel economy and be a critical element in fighting global warming. Oops. Um, so today we're gonna to dive deep into Walking County, Washington, uh, where there's enough fossil fuel export proposals on the books 
to more than double the state of Washington's carbon footprint, uh, and Portland, Oregon, where there's an ongoing effort to zone out uh, bulk storage of fossil fuels. But there's really a whole lot more going on out there. I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, in Tacoma, the Protect Tacoma Tide Flats is a, a coalition that's part of the Stand Up to Oil campaign that's working to pass interim regulations that prohibit new and expanded fossil fuel uh, infrastructure in the Tacoma Tide Flats. That's the industrial and port area downtown. Um, and you'll hear with the Whatcom County Council, the constant pressure from new proposals in a lot of these places means that two steps are needed. The first one, an interim step to prevent new permits from being considered. Um, and second, long-term land use code changes that can be implemented through a number of processes in Tacoma to sub-area planning process that then leads to more formal land use code changes. Um, Milwaukee, uh, the Board of Harbor Commissioners and the Public Works, both of which work under the city of Milwaukee, uh, amended a lease to not allow U.S. oil to receive, I'm going to quote here, receive, handle, store, ship, or otherwise process or distribute crude oil at the port. Now, ports are established differently in each state um, and worth a webinar of their own, but in this case, it was the city powers over the land uh, uses that made the change possible. In Vancouver, Washington, just across the river from Portland, uh, it's the site of North America's largest oil train proposal. There, the city council passed an ordinance preventing the siting of new bulk fossil fuel projects. And while that doesn't directly impact the existing fight against the Tesoro Savage, also called Vancouver Energy Terminal, doesn't keep it from moving forward. Once that project is stopped, and we think it will be, the ordinance can prevent new proposals from coming forward in the future. Uh, in Philadelphia, we see contracting requirements coming to the city uh, that regulate new development in the Southport area, it's an industrial zone. And that introduced a series of what they call gates that effectively prevented new large scale fossil fuel projects from being cited there. And finally, final example for right now, um, Baltimore. The successful defeat of one oil train terminal there has led to efforts to ban any siting of new oil train uh, terminals in the city. And that's been closely connected to land use requirements for fair development that allow the community to direct land development, including industrial lands, um, and make sure those developments reflect their values. So that's a, you know, it, it's a partial list. There's a lot going on. Um, but there's a lot of powerful municipal, municipal action underway. So if you're on the call and already working on these issues where you live, uh, we'd love to have you speak up in the Q&A. Uh, take a minute to let us know what you're up to and how it's going. Uh, sharing best practices, what happens in our communities, I think it's one of the best ways we can network together, identify other overlapping and intersecting issues that we can support, uh, and ultimately take strong local action on climate. In the meantime, though, I'm looking forward to hearing from Barry Buchanan on the Whatcom County work, and then turning it over to Daphne Wisham and Nick Caleb to discuss Portland, municipal bonding, and some of the other places that they're seeing real action. So I'm going to stop now and stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Barry. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar this morning. I'm glad you all could make it. I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about what we've done here in Whatcom County. Our, our uh, kind of furious activism really started with the coal terminal years and years ago, where uh, we knew this was coming. The proposal had been filed, and the community took action and came to their elected leaders to, to uh, find an answer how we could, could prevent that from happening and, and also future fossil fuel uh, exports out of Cherry Point. Uh, Whatcom County has a lot of big bad threats uh, that potentially we could come across. We have over 200 million tons of capacity for exports out of, out of uh, Cherry Point here in Whatcom County. We have oil trains pipelines. We had the proposed coal terminal. We have two uh, large refineries. We have LPG refinery and we have a, a marine export facility that still has a lot of capacity. It's, it's the only West Court port, deep water point, port, excuse me, yeah, but got a little tangled there, uh, that has capacity left in it. So when, when uh, in 2013, the election basically revolved around the coal terminal and uh, finding leaders that would stand up for our community. So uh, we ran as a slate, we were elected, and we took the challenge. And when we were developing our, our comp comprehensive plan update last uh, year, we introduced um, uh, policies that would prevent uh, unrefined exports out of Cherry Point, including coal, obviously crude oil and propane and uh, natural gas. 
So uh, as we were developing those policies, uh, it became evident we needed a little bit uh, longer time, a little bit more public process. So that that effort got put into the hands of our Whatcom County Planning Commission, who took a, an in-depth look at it and, and had a lot more public uh, public hearings, public input. and But we felt that it was important to be able to stop the uh, any more applications from being vested. So we introduced an interim ordinance, or excuse me, an emergency ordinance back in August. And it was a, it was quite a night. It was a lot of folks there. Uh, I remember reading the entire ordinance into the record. I've never said the word whereas that many times in my life and I never want to again. Um, but we passed that uh, and we were off and running on a moratorium for uh, fossil fuel exports out of Cherry Point. And that is really only a stopgap measure uh, that allows us to be able to look at permanent legislation that will do the same thing. Um, we have initiated a, uh, a legal study to find out just what tools we do have. We're using land use and in our, in our uh, prevalent uh, reasons are public health and safety, environmental concerns, and the protection of jobs uh, that would be lost if there was if Cherry Point became an export terminal of, of crude oil. So the legal study, we it is underway. We have selected a firm. Um, we haven't got, gotten very far with them yet as we only signed the contract, I believe, last month. Um, but we need to know what we can do and what we can't do. So um, any challenges that come our way, we're ready to deal with. Um, my role as council chair has been to make sure that we uh, obviously update this. this. We're on our third update of the interim moratorium ordinance now. We consider that next Tuesday on the 26th. Um, we expect to have a great crowd out supporting us, which is so important. Um, it is just so important to have that community behind us. It's, it's what got this effort started years ago, and it's, it's important that we have that momentum with our community as we move forward. And I think I couldn't I couldn't emphasize that much how how important it is for the community to come out and support their local leaders because these decisions not only are they tough to do at the time but they they take a lot of perseverance to be able to sustain it because we have to renew it every six months so um, a lot of pressure from the industry when we would have public hearings for these renewals but we had we had uh, our activists out uh, cheering us on and and helping us fight the fight to to make sure that we're doing what we can here in Whatcom County to affect climate change and uh, other and public safety and health. I mean, it's very important. Oil trains through our community is not what we want. Uh, we were it started out with coal trains, but you know, the Lummi Nation helped us get through that. And uh, I think um, as far as the industry goes, there it was a lot of lobbying with council members. There's been a lot of. Uh, threats for legal action, but there has been no legal action taken as of yet. Um, one of the big concerns that the industry had was that we were doing a legal study on to see to see what tools we did have. So that that's kind of an indicator to me that we are on the right track. Um, I think a few things that uh, that you should tell your your communities that, that want to come out and help uh, help you as leaders to implement these kinds of policies is Make sure they have, make sure they have one idea and that they can get behind, and also make sure that they have that perseverance to go the distance because it's not it's not a short process. It's something that takes a lot of time, takes a lot of commitment, and uh, I just I think it's just so important that we get the word out that that these kind of things can be done in local communities because we're not getting the support we need out of the federal government. So. Um, I applaud uh, Stand for holding this webinar. I think it's important to educate. Uh, everyone, everyone that's involved all across this nation uh, in in these items of of fighting climate change and protecting our environment. So that's all I have. Back to you, Matt. Matt, just one second. This is Ann. I I muted your line while we were hearing gotcha. from you. Yeah, th thanks, thanks so much, Barry. Uh, really, it's been inspired leadership and really appreciate the, all that you've been doing on this. Um, and now, Daphne, do we have you up next uh, or Nick? Awesome. I'll turn it over to Nick Caleb uh, and we'll wait for a second. I think we're going to see your screen and get that shared. Yeah, I'm going to 
talk for about a minute and then I'll share the screen. Um, so before we talk um, as CSE, we wanna mention that we almost always work in coalition with partners. And so it's important for us to recognize people that we've been working with for the last three years almost on these projects. So um, especially Physicians for Social, Resp Social Responsibility in Portland, 350PDX, the Climate Action Coalition, Columbia River Keeper, Crag Law Center, and all the neighborhood groups that we've been working with. Um, in Portland, this has been a fight that we couldn't have waged without all that support. Um, and, you know, for people who aren't in Portland, it kind of looks like Portland, you know, of course, Portland is being Portland is sort of the attitude of, of what's going on. But um, for us here, it's only in the last couple of years that the grassroots really has had a voice in city politics. It may not seem that way from the outside because we've done some climate stuff, but it's usually kind of like top level, non-binding bureaucratic stuff. And so getting a community to actually say something like no to new fossil fuel infrastructure is a different step. And um, it's been hard fought. And again, we can't do it without help. So I'm going to try to share my screen here. We'll see how that goes. How's that? That's good. Okay. Alrighty. So our story starts in 2014 and um, it basically surrounds a, a, a Canadian fossil fuel company called Pemina, big major investor in the tar sands, coming into our community and proposing a $500 million terminal, uh, propane export terminal that would have brought about 1.6 million uh, gallons of, of propane per day in by rail. Um, and initially our, our port and our mayor welcomed this investment with open arms. Um, it was something that didn't really have a process associated with it because of how the Port of Portland works. Um, activists and community members started to get uh, a grasp on what this project was, its scale, and we began to sort of organize an opposition, not really finding that we had much to do because again, there was no public process for us. Uh, but somebody overlooked the fact that you're not allowed to pipe hazardous materials across sensitive riparian zones. And this opened up a process where the city was going to have to amend its code in order to allow propane to get piped from the Port of Portland to the ships that would carry it overseas. We used that public process as a referendum on the entire project. Um, organized very, very quickly, started turning out hundreds of people to public um, public fora and um, the Planning and Sustainability Commission is a, a body that had to sort of certify these land use changes. We actually lost there the first time um, by one vote that changed at the very end in dramatic fashion. And instead of, of kind of giving up and going home, um, we decided that we were gonna fight this battle, you know, as long as we possibly could. And so the politics for us were that we had the mayor who was very strongly supportive of this propane export terminal saying, you know, maybe it's a bridge fuel, maybe there's some equity behind it and a lot of greenwashing to it. Um, we heard that he wasn't gonna change his mind. We didn't believe that. And so we started, it was right around Earth Day, luckily for us. So we started doing a lot of Earth Day related actions. Um, we started postering around town. Um, our mayor is called Charlie Hales, so we started putting up posters that said fossil fuel Charlie all over town. The media thought it was really funny, and so they started reporting on this. Um, we were um, we interrupted a council session. The press was recovering this stuff all over the place. We put in thousands and thousands of calls into the city, and ultimately, after not that long, the mayor decided to change his mind, and he pulled his support for the fracked gas project, as you can see in the slide here. And it got international news because it was such a big deal. Um, theoretically, another commissioner could have picked up the project and made it their own, but we were so organized and we had so much effect that nobody wanted to touch it and they sort of just let the project die. Um, so from then, we moved on to saying, we don't wanna have to fight this defensive battle all the time because what other project could come into that spot at the Port of Portland? So we began to organize um, in an affirmative way to try to get a law passed. And be, just because of time constraints here, I won't be able to talk about it all, but there's a white paper called Making a Difference that, that pretty much details all that we did there. Um, so over the course of a, a year of action, we finally got to the point of passing a resolution. And so the language in this resolution says, the city council will actively oppose the expansion of infrastructure whose primary purpose is transporting or storing fossil fuels in or through Portland or adjacent waterways. Um, at this point, 
we still didn't have a great idea of what this meant. Um, from, the, from the position of advocates, we'd been working with the city about what, they, what we believe that they could actually do to impact the storage and transfer of fossil fuels through our city. And our um, recommendation, which is still the same as it is today, was that they should amend the code to prevent new fossil fuel infrastructure, the zoning code. They should imp impose fossil fuel risk bonds, which Daphne is gonna talk about later, and they should add enhanced environmental and seismic review to any of these large scale facilities. Ultimately, the city opted to go with option number one alone to, to do the zoning uh, changes. So after a year of development, many stakeholder meetings, um, many, 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 many stakeholder meetings, um, we finally passed a ordinance um, to ban new fossil fuel infrastructure, large scale fossil fuel infrastructure. So. This is in yellow what the code says. Um, we created a, a land use called bulk fossil fuel terminals, which means um, either it's got marine railroad, pipeline transport access, um, and storage capacity of two million gallons or more, uh, or transloading ability, which means to move from like rail to ship. So that became a, a regulated use that was banned. So nothing that fit that category was allowed in the city. And then we also um, prevented the expansion of existing fossil fuel infrastructure because we were worried that some of the existing terminals would just expand their footprint and kind of like make up for that capacity anyway. Um, initially, the city was going to allow a 10 or 15% expansion of existing storage terminals, but the fossil fuel industry told the city that they, and it was to incentivize um, seismic upgrades, but the, the fossil fuel industry said that they weren't going to do seismic uh, infrastructure upgrades regardless. And so the city got rid of the, the expansion into some will cap it where it's at. Um, so very, very significant, um, first of its kind. Um, a lot of design went into making sure that we weren't running afoul of commerce clause type uh, issues. And we, we thought about this in advance, um, but nevertheless, we recently got a bad decision out of a land use board of appeals and um, so, and this is pretty much reported is that a court has reviewed Oregon's or, or Portland's uh, fossil fuel infrastructure terminal zoning amendments and said no to it. Um, there are a lot of caveats and we wanted to, to let people know who are around the, the region who might be thinking about doing this, that you should pay close attention to the dormant commerce clause, but also pay attention to this appeal that's currently going on. We're, we're going into the Oregon Court of Appeals because it's very likely that the, the land use board decision is gonna get overruled. Um, our opinion as appellants, both the city and us and some of our partners are appealing this case, is that this is a really poor understanding of the Dormant Commerce Clause from the Land Use Board of Appeals. Um, the Anne is gonna send out some briefs that our attorneys and the city's attorneys and the League of Oregon Cities have put out, uh, amicus brief in, the, in this case, so that you can see in more detail, but. Basically, we come into this in a situation where, um, and the Land Use Board of Appeals is an administrative sort of a hearings court. It's not a, it's not a, a, a constitutional court, I guess you could say. Um, so they do land use sp specialty. And so it's already weird because they're making pretty big rulings on a constitutional issue and not just rent, uh, land use issues. And then another sort of oddity of this case is that we have three land use uh, board hearing officers and two of those three officers recused themselves because they had some kind of a personal stake. So one of the three made this decision. So um, anyway, dormant commerce clause for folks that are not super familiar basically just means that you're not allowed to, when you regulate, you're not allowed to say that local interests have some kind of um, by it, so some kind of benefit that out-of-state interests can't have, or you can't just burden out-of-state interests and protect local interests. In our case, that didn't happen, so it's it's odd that the commerce, the dormant commerce clause applied in our case, um, and there's a great amount of precedent to suggest that as long as your regulations are neutral and they affect all entities, similarly situated entities in the same way, that you should survive um, challenge. And one one benefit that we didn't get here locally um, is that the 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 cities and the states are supposed to get, um, they're gonna, supposed to get a lot of the benefit of the doubt here. The burden of proof is supposed to be on the challengers. And in our case, for some reason, the, the hearings officer gave a lot of that sort of benefit to the, 
to the, the challengers instead. So it's, it's kind of a complicated area here. And I know that the Commerce Clause has served as a, a barrier for a lot of people as they think about going forward here. But we want to say to anybody who's thinking about putting in land use regulations or risk bonds or enhanced environmental review, take a very close look at this. And we think that the closer you get to it, what looks like a, a pretty strong barrier actually turns into something that's very manageable. And again, we expect that on appeal that we're going to get a much better decision out of our, our formal courts and the Oregon Court of Appeals. Um, so I think that's my time. And I've you know, got lots to say, but um, I'll wait for questions to answer what you all want to hear about. Hey, thanks so much, Nick. Uh, that's uh, really fantastic and, and amazing work from all of you there in uh, Portland. Uh, I think the Dormant Commerce Clause issue is going to be a, an interesting one, one we juxtapose it with uh, uh, all the land use powers that municipalities have. Um, we're having some great questions come in, and for those of you who are posting questions to the Q&A screen, we see you. Uh, and we see those questions, and we're going to address them at the end um, after Daphne. So Daphne Weisham, take it away. Thanks, Matt, and thanks to the folks at Stan for hosting this webinar. Um, just to reemphasize a couple of things that Nick just touched on, when we first moved forward with our uh, opposition to the Pemina propane terminal, we did have a suite of three issues, which included uh, the ordinance that we did succeed in passing, um, risk bonds, which I'm going to be talking about, as well as enhanced environmental review. And we think that that suite of three options is really something that other cities looking to duplicate um, what we've tried to do here in Portland um, should consider in moving forward. We think it's sort of like a triple insurance policy um, for local activists. So um, I'm gonna be focusing in on uh, a way that local folks can make polluters pay locally for the risks and the costs that they are currently externally externalizing on all of us locally and globally. Um, all you need to do is look at the headlines today to see the cost of climate change. Some are suggesting that hurricanes Irma and Hugo alone, the costs from those, those two hurricanes will be over 200 billion. Now that doesn't include the cost from Puerto Rico that has now been uh, hit by Hurricane Maria. Um, and who will pay? Well, the question uh, was asked by NRDC in a study that they did a few years ago. They found that in 2012, uh, climate-related, weather-related property claims uh, came to about $110 billion, and of that, private insurers only picked up 25% of the tab, leaving the other 75% for U.S. taxpayers to cover. Um, as they wrote in their report, um, climate change doesn't show up as a line item in the budget, but you could say that uh, there is a climate disruption budget that's relatively uh, invisible, but it's equal to one out of every six dollars spent on non-defense discretionary programs, making it the number one item in that part of the federal budget. So if our climate disruption budget in 2012 was bigger than what we spent on things like transportation or education, imagine what it's going to be like in 2017, where we have damages from these hurricanes exceeding 200 billion. Um, but there are other costs that are, are, of course, associated with fossil fuels that we all know about. Um, that also get picked up by the public sector. Um, the cost of fossil fuel extraction, storage, refining, transport, and combustion, um, whether it's the cost of abandoned infrastructure and mines that need to be cleaned up, or the cost of explosions at fossil fuel refineries or storage tanks, we're all being exposed to these risks and costs that are not being adequately covered by existing insurance and financial assurance mechanisms, which means ultimately that the costs are then falling back on us, the taxpayer. So um, just to give you one example, um, you may recall this major disaster that occurred in Lac Megantique in, in Canada, where an oil train derailed and uh, exploded and vaporized the town, killing 47 people. The cost there was roughly $2 billion, but the company declared bankruptcy and uh, left the Canadian government to pick up the tab. 
So what we're trying to do at CSE is to work to put the onus for all of these risks and costs back on the polluter, not the taxpayer. Um, we're working with elected officials throughout the U.S. and Canada interested in pledging to take on the health and safety risks of existing fossil fuel infrastructure um, together with the climate risks uh, that fossil fuels pose to all of us um, with this concept that we call fossil fuel risk bonds. Um, we're excited that the mayor of Portland, Oregon, Ted Wheeler, has expressed interest in moving forward with us at CSE and pursuing this option as a way of further safeguarding our city from the hazards of the fossil fuel industry. Um, we're also in touch with other elected officials who are eager to work with us on this. And um, we will be sending out to everybody who has RSVP for this call a draft um, model resolution that we uh, help prepare for the city of San Luis Obispo. Um, elected officials there have expressed interest in uh, putting in place a fossil fuel risk bond to address the concerns that they have over oil trains that are coming through their town. So just to sort of um, discuss uh, the fossil fuel risk bond program, there are broad, two broad categories. One is you could sort of think of it as a point source risk, and the other would be the non-point source risk. So climate change and fracking related earthquakes that damage homes, those could be considered non-point source risks, sort of more generalized risks that are associated with fossil fuel extraction and combustion. Um, whereas potential explosions of large storage tanks or other local hazards would fall into the category of what, you could call point source risks covered under the fossil fuel risk bonding program. So the way we envision the fossil fuel risk bond uh, program being put in place, it could work in tandem with other market-based solutions like a carbon tax um, for internalizing the social costs of carbon. However, unlike these other approaches, uh, the fossil fuel risk bond program would directly be targeted at public financial risks. Um, we've, we've written a report, which is up on our website, um, and I think Anne is going to share a link to that report with all of you. Um, our website is sustainable-economy.org. Um, we know that uh, Portland is overdue for a 9.0 earthquake, and we can't afford to keep adding more explosive infrastructure and hazards to an already dangerous earthquake subduction zone. Um, as I mentioned, other cities want to perhaps take on uh, gas pipelines or oil trains or other proposed fossil fuel infrastructure where they are afraid that they're going to be left holding the bag when there's a, a major explosion. Um, so what we want to do is build a bottom up uh, strong network of local communities um, saying no to not only uh, new fossil fuel infrastructure, but continued pilfering of our public funds for these outrageous and growing costs that the fossil fuel industry is externalizing on all of us, um, and say yes to a healthier, resilient future. So um, if you want to learn more and get involved in this network, we have um, another website, which is knownewffi.org. Um, if you go up there, you can see a tab where you can sign up as either an elected official or an individual or an organization or a business. And we will add you to our growing list of folks that are eager uh, to work with us on this um, approach. And um, if you have specific questions around this, our president and senior economist, John Talberth, will be um, responding in greater detail uh, in the Q&A. Thank you. Well, thanks so much to all three of you. And uh, we've got a bunch of great questions coming in. Um, super useful stuff. And I'll turn it back over to you. And uh, we can get people's questions answered. Terrific. <clears throat> Thanks, Matt. Thank you, all um, the presenters. I think I've got everybody unmuted for the Q&A and discussion. Um, and I want to just point out um, a couple of the ways to, to uh, participate interactively today. And uh, 
One is to um, just drop into the Q&A or the, well, first of all, I should remind everybody, this is a public webcast and we may also have some reporters on the, on the line, which would be great because we want this work to be well known and to spread far and wide. But just, you know, don't give away the store if there's something that you would just want to share activist to activist. Just keep that a little close to your chest. But information that you can share publicly if um, we would welcome your dropping into the chat or the Q&A that uh, where you're working and what you're working on, how, how what you're doing day to day relates to um, to this topic today. And um, and then, of course, uh, questions that you have for the presenters or insights that you want to share. Also very welcome. If you are OK with us uh, seeing and hearing you today. Put that in uh, to the Q&A and we'll try to bring up your audio and video. And if you want to um, ask your question or make the note anonymously, go ahead and use the chat for that. Um, and we do have some really great questions. Uh, the presenters have probably been taking a look at them too, but I just was going to kind of start from um, the top of the Q&A pile. And Matt, wave your hands around <laughs> violently, or other presenters if you had a different idea. But um, there are there's a there's one anonymous question. Let me kick us off with this, and then I'll go ahead and unmute um, Charles, who could be our next question. I'll give Charles a heads up. And while I get Charles set up, let me ask this question: Is quote unquote local standing at risk legally? I volunteer, Nick. <laughs> uh, I'm not entirely sure what the questioner is asking about local standing on this and what is it is it, if it's referring to like if we take steps locally how so maybe the anonymous commenter could clarify a little bit and so this, this came in when I was talking, so, so I think it may be addressing the question of local powers regarding land use uh, regulation and zoning. Um, and I would say that if, if in fact that's what the question is about, uh, that's not at risk. We have a, a national uh, system where these all these different zoning decisions and permitting decisions about local land use uh, are implemented by thousands of municipalities. Um, in theory, I guess it could be at risk someday, but it's certainly nobody that I know of is going after it now. Okay, and along that I would add that um, the Supreme Court has said repeatedly that when municipalities are regulating for health and safety that their powers are actually at their strongest. So when, when you act uh, regulating for health and safety, you're acting in a very protected zone. And the law is very fluid and political and, you know, it can change, but that's how it is right now. Yeah, and if I might add one thing, that, that's the, the purpose of our legal study that, we've, that we're uh, embarking on is to, to look at just that, just what, you know, where do local powers begin and end? And uh, I would agree that health and safety is, uh, of your public is, is probably the number one priority. Terrific, we're gonna bring in Charles's Charles. audio. And for those who um, are just on by phone, Charles is wearing a really great shirt today. <laughs> He's wearing his Stop Oil Trains Now shirt. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Welcome, we, Charles, and um, and share your question. Um, okay, so um, I'm down here in San Luis Obispo, and um, we are really active on infrastructure. We were really fortunate to stop the Phillips 66 oil train terminal proposal, and um, now we've got an initiative uh, that we're getting together for the ballot to stop fan fracking and stop new oil and oil development here. And my question is, and, and really want to express, express appreciation to stand for helping us in that effort. It was a coalition effort down here to stop Phillips. And that's really kind of what my question um, is in general to you folks that play this on a lot higher level than I do. How do you see yourselves helping us locals? How can you be most helpful to us in supporting us in the work we're doing here in the grassroots? And how is there some way to start putting together our defenses um, when you know the fossil lobbies coming after us after we win politically? They come back and are shoving us in the courts. 
Um, and how do we start coordinating our defensive efforts on these similar issues across so many of our communities? I mean, economy of scale here for defense. That was kind of long-winded. Thank you so much for, this is a great learning experience for me. Well, I'll jump yeah, in. Yeah, I'll jump in. Thanks, Charles, for all your activism. And um, as I mentioned in um, my comments, we are actually in touch with your city council. Um, they are possibly interested in pursuing the fossil fuel risk bonding approach that I was discussing. And I will be, um, you will be getting a copy of the model resolution that we prepared for the city council. Um, it would, of course, there's only so much that we can do up here in Portland, Oregon to make sure that that happens. That's where you come in. If you are eager to, um, if you see this as an option that you might want to include in the in the suite of issues that you're working on to discourage the expansion of the fossil fuel industry in San Luis Obispo, then um, we'd love to work with you on strategy on that. Um, I think, as I was saying earlier, you know, um, and somebody asked for a repetition of the three things um, that I touched on. One is, you know, the the, the resolution that becomes an, a binding ordinance. That's 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 option number one. The other is the fossil fuel risk bonding. We feel like that's sort of a an insurance policy of sorts, and it's also more appropriate for uh, communities like San Luis Obispo, where you're not necessarily a port city, um, so it's not necessarily a question of new fossil fuel infrastructure, but you just want to deal with the hazards that are coming through your community on a daily basis and you want to make sure that those risks and the cost of those risks are borne by the polluter by the by the oil industry and not by the community um, and then the third thing is the enhanced environmental protection which you know that john uh, i'm sorry nick can speak more to that but um one other thing just before i forget i don't i'm not sure we thank portland audubon who was uh, also part of our coalition i just wanted to do a shout out to them since they were really great um, in, in working with us. And can I jump in real quick? Um, we've um, been really lucky in Portland um, to have pro bono representation as interveners in our own case here. And we have in Oregon quite a few public interest law firms that have, so I, I think as you begin to organize around whatever it is you do, like checking in with public interest for law firms that are in your city or in your region, early on is really important. Just even if the first time you talk to them, they're kind of like, okay, we don't really get it. What's going on? Like getting it on their radar so that you can repeatedly kind of like give them updates and even asking them to testify and maybe ask them for some things. Like some of those groups will get involved um, and they have an interest to get involved as well. So public interest C3 type law firms have to fundraise as well. And, you know, here the in Portland, our ordinance was like a national item. And so, you know, they, they also, they want to win, but they also care about the profile associated with it. So there are a lot of ways that you can pitch this to, to attorneys in your area. And then with regard to national groups, I know that 350 and Food and Water Watch and some other groups are really thinking about this stuff at a national level as well. Um, Sierra Club is, I think they're doing more of like the renewable stuff, but those groups have resources as well. And so we should be kind of like knocking on their doors quite a bit to say like, hey, if you're going to be looking into doing this work nationally, like be ready to help us to prepare those legal defenses because we need to actually win and set precedent if we're going to be successful and have this stuff sweep the nation. Yeah. But also one more thing just to throw out there, which is that the youth and the elders were absolutely critical in our successes. Uh, the raging grannies were very uh, vocal. They were sort of our secret weapon and the young people that testified at city hall they just riveted um, city councilors with their testimony and we've now uh, worked with them to help set up a youth climate commission where they will actually have a formal role in advising the city council on uh, climate matters. I mean, after all, it's their future that we're talking about and yet they don't have a voice. So I think that can be done uh, in San Luis Obispo and, and other cities all over the place. Sorry, Matt. So, yeah, if I could just add two things, those, those are all great. Um, I think one of the things that you touched on, Charles, is the common uh, issues that we're all facing. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, that, that's one of the reasons we created the Crude Awakening Network that we mentioned earlier. Uh, anybody who's on this call who's interested in joining, we have a monthly call. Uh, it usually lasts about an hour and a half, and we have people call in from all over the country 
uh, and share what tactics they're taking, what experiences they're having, where there's setbacks, um, what kind of best practices is really what we're trying to get at, how we can share those things with each other. Um, I, I think Nick's absolutely right. We should be reaching out for, to national groups for resources uh, uh, on some of these legal fronts. But uh, at a lower level, by, by sharing together, I think we can really actually amplify our voices and what we're doing. Um, associated with that as well, uh, for folks who are interested, we are hosting a national conference with about 15 other groups, uh, November 17 to 20 in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, not California. Uh, and that will be focused on folks who are fighting fossil fuel infrastructure. Uh, and we invite you to, to reach out to us through AM through this webinar, both to get added to the Crude Awakening Network uh, mailing list for the next call, and also to get information about that conference. Those are great notes, Matt. And we will um, we will put the uh, once we have the recording from today posted, I'll send it around to everybody who's RSVP'd, and we'll put other goodies in there. Several people. Um, are asking and, and Daphne is, uh, is letting folks know that the documents um, uh, that were used in Portland, we're going to send those around so that you can check them out. And um, uh, so you'll have those in your inboxes as soon as we get, uh, get the webcast posted. And um, if you're interested in these things, you can also let us know now. You can drop a note in the chat or in the Q&A, say I'm interested in the Crude Awakening Network or I want more information about the conference. And, uh, and we will reach out, but we'll try to remember to put all that in that email also. Um, and um, I have um, a question that I want to bring up um, from Minda. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, promote you to a panelist, is what it's called, <laughs> in the webcast system. And hopefully we'll be able to see and hear you in just a moment. Oh, great. Hey, Minda. Hey, can you hear me okay? I sure can. Great. Um, my question was really simple. I was particularly interested in the zoning um, discussion from earlier, and I, I just am um, not very familiar with it at all, and I'm curious about what the first steps are. Are the first steps reaching out to city councilors? Are the first steps um, a lawyer? I'm just sort of curious about uh, the end result is really neat, but sort of how do you, what is the first thing you should be doing? Barry, you want to talk about that? Sure, you know, again, we started, we started out, uh, you know, our efforts with a huge amount of public support and a huge amount of ideas that were coming from the public. And as we, the tools that we used legislatively was, was to uh, approach the comprehensive plan with that's the goals his priorities for the council for the next uh, 10 years. And uh, <clears throat> once we had kind of uh, congealed all our ideas into this, you know, the moratorium on exporting of, uh, of, of unrefined fuels, then we were able to, to move forward. We had a solid idea. But we wouldn't have been able to get started without that support from our community. You have to, you have to turn to your community, you have to trust your community, and, and you really have to inform them as well. And I, again, we just couldn't have done it without the support that we had here. It was just tremendous. And if I could get a, even a little more basic, Minda, I, I think the, the answer is it depends uh, in part, uh, depending on what state you're in and what your city regulations look like. Um, each of the things that we talked about earlier uh, was usually associated with a land use plan update. Um, so the, these land use plans exist. Uh, there, there's, there's code on the books. They've usually been passed as an as a ordinance and created in code by a, a elected body of some sort. Um, and so one of the things that I would say is, first off, you can reach out to us. We're happy to help you take first steps. Um, secondly, depending on where you are, it may be that you're reaching out to a city council member and, and perhaps one that represents you directly uh, or the one that seems friendliest and ask them, what are the opportunities to influence uh, land use coding or zoning? Uh, who can I talk to? Uh, when are the next steps for public engagement? Um, that sort of thing. Yeah, I would definitely say that attorneys can be really useful here because um, attorneys are always useful. Um, just kidding. But um, land use is a is a is a tough area of law. I don't practice land use specifically, so we have to rely on 
sort of like outside counsel and expertise when we really want to get into details. So sometimes you get lucky and there are people who are, who are really like knowledgeable in that area who live in your community or similarly aligned. So if, if you do have those people, having them early on can be really, really useful because if you run into a city that kind of wants to give you the runaround and maybe like, tell you they can't do it for whatever reason and you've got support to help you sort of like identify why those are false claims and you can maybe move through that a little bit better and, and cities generally uh, whether it's fair or not they they listen to people that have lawyers a lot more <laughs> than they do with that it's just one of those facts um, and uh, similarly we can also provide some support um, our funding for me is to to support people who are doing this work and so um, if there are kind of like basic questions that you need answered the research tasks and stuff, a lot of times I can take those on or at least search through my Rolodex or ask our partners until we find somebody that's doing that type of work that you might need. Great. I'm going to bring in a question from Helen and then a question from Ethan. All right. Let's see if we can bring up Helen. Let's see, I'm having a little trouble getting. Maybe you could read out the questions. Yeah, I think I should. Okay, Helen, I'm sorry about that. Here we go. Helen is with a nonprofit watchdog in Ventura County, uh, Citizens for Responsible Oil and Gas in Ventura County, fighting permits at the county level and working with our state representatives who are all supportive. Currently, we have two suits against the industry pending in Superior Court. How best to get the local elected officials to take our CEQA arguments seriously? Um, and maybe somebody can yeah, make sure that we spell out what that is again. They don't, and they don't take them seriously. And we have numerous examples of errors on the planning staff all set to benefit the industry. And Matt, you're muted. Uh, yeah, this is a critical question. I think it plays uh, or connects really well to uh, Barry's comment that having lots of public participation is a thing that's going to actually make your local elected officials pay attention. Um, there may not be a process in place for those permits right now where they're actively seeking public input, uh, which is usually one of the best places to participate. Um, but if they're not uh, seeking input right now, that doesn't mean you can't give it. Um, and so I'd encourage you that there's any number of things you can do. You can hold a town hall or a forum uh, to talk about the issues, to represent why you're concerned. Um, I don't know the status of your, of your local groups there or whatnot, but uh, that's something that we can help with if you wish. Um, but anything that shows that there's actual public attention being paid to this issue where the, the voting public uh, is concerned about the same issues that you're identifying with uh, the California Environmental Quality Act, uh, CEQA. Um, that's, that's I, I would say, my, my go-to effort to get officials to pay attention, but I, I see Barry's unmuted, and perhaps he has some thoughts as well. Yeah, I just wanted to throw in, I mentioned it before, <clears throat> of having one idea. If I get 10 people uh, that, that meet with me and I have 10 different ideas, it, it's a lot harder to get behind than if there's been some organization taking place uh, prior to, to meeting with elected officials, that 10 people are bringing the same idea or close to it. Th that way it doesn't get fragmented. So I think it's important that when you move forward, you move forward with a, with a strong voice and a unified voice. And uh, this is Anne. I'm going to bring in Ethan, um, who until recently was with Stand Out Earth doing great oil chain work. Hey, Ethan. And um, while I make sure that we can see and hear you, um, uh, I have a follow-up actually from Minda's question um, for the host to, for the presenters to think about, um, and we'll go to it after Ethan's question, which is um, uh, Barry noted, you know, he knew that he had all of this support. Um, how do you find out if you're in a community that there are other people who um, feel similarly to you if there isn't already a group formed around this? So let me just let you all think about that for a minute. And let me um, make it so we can hear Ethan. Can you hear me? Oh, we can. Okay, good. Right on. Great. 
Everyone, this has been really, really interesting. You all are doing amazing work. Um, I'm curious if like folks um, on the various like legal and policy teams looking at local ordinances have looked at whether or not there's anything that could be done with regards to pipelines, oil and gas pipelines that are federally, federally regulated, if there are any like local hooks that could potentially prevent uh, or restrict pipeline development specifically, that's my question. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll take a shot at that one. That's our that's our next step. Is we we have a proposed pipeline that that uh, it's a Canadian pipeline that uh, the Canadians uh, up in British Columbia are refusing to allow it to run through their neighborhoods. So Williams or it's not Williams, is it? Kinder Morgan. Kinder Morgan. Sorry, they they want to now run this pipeline across the Canadian border through the state of Washington and then under the Strait of Georgia back to a Canadian territory over on Vancouver Island. So um, while we had the moratorium in place at Cherry Point, which was the original destination point in the U.S. for that before it left to go back into Canada, they are now proposing a little wiggle and to put it up oh, just a few miles to the north in a different urban growth area. So we are now considering what we're going to do to be able to do a broader uh, countywide initiative to, to help block that pipeline from coming through our, our county. They're also considering doing eminent domain along the way for those unwilling property owners that don't want to give easements. So it's, it's a big deal right now where it's kind of scrambling to figure out how we're going to approach this. But, uh, I guess the jury's out, but we'll get back to you on, on what we end up successfully being able to implement. Yeah, and I would also add that there there is a lot of state authority with regard to pipelines, especially when pipelines are crossing waterways. The state retains, all states retain Clean Water Act authority, and a lot of pipelines that are being defeated around the country are being defeated under provisions that allow states to take a close look at that. So that's that's one thing. But if you don't live in a state that's particularly like working with you on that. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we are just working with risk bonds is that we think this might be a tool that can be useful for pipelines as well. We probably can't within that say no in the same way that we could with storage facilities and transfer facilities for fossil fuels, but we may be able to put a very high cost um, for sort of like worst case catastrophe that would serve as a disincentive to building a pipeline in your community. Thanks. Okay, great. Did anyone else want to jump in on that question? Um, I just wanted to add, you know, just seconding what Nick was saying and also um, that especially for conservative uh, rural areas, when you begin talking about, you know, why should you be paying the costs and the risks uh, associated with this pipeline coming through your community and have your land taken away from you with eminent domain, um, you, you can begin to shift uh, perhaps where uh, a blanket no uh, for, for new fossil fuel infrastructure may not work, where you can shift the costs uh, back on the, on the, uh, the, the industry. I think you, you I mean, we're, we're going to be trying this out. We have yet to prove it, but this is something we're, we're going to be trying out in Southern Oregon where we have the pipeline coming through. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Ethan. And um, so let me give the panelists a moment to talk about that question of, if you're, uh, we've heard a little bit about step one procedurally, what about finding your allies? Um, and we did have one question about working with faith communities. And I wonder if um, any of you are organizing with faith communities, um, other places that you found supporters and suggestions for people who are um, not necessarily plugged into activist groups or there aren't activist groups yet forming around these issues and, and what they can do. And I know that we are at time, so I think we're gonna have our panelists answer this one. And then um, <clears throat> if they have a little time after the webcast, I might see if we can hit one or two more questions that came in that we haven't gotten to, but we'll, we'll let most of, um, most of us go. Um, but yeah, go ahead and on this uh, question about finding your allies. I'll jump in. 
Um, I, I, I would say that actually the faith community is a good place to, to start locally. Um, depending on your community, um, a lot of the, uh, the churches in the Pacific Northwest, I don't know where you're calling from, um, have begun to mobilize and organize around the climate crisis. And they have, uh, for example, the Unitarians uh, were very engaged in our local climate action coalition. Um, they have a Community for Earth um, coalition that has been very engaged in opposing new fossil fuel infrastructure. So I think the faith community is the place to start. Um, and, you know, beginning, beginning your own uh, group, perhaps on Facebook is another suggestion. I'm not sure if that would work in your community, but uh, I'll let others uh, chime in. Another thing I was thinking of is find a find a kind of a, a common an organization that's common, you know, coast to coast, like like a Sierra Club that would have a chapter in your in your vicinity that could help you organize. And they they would certainly, I'm sure, be supportive of your cause. Yeah, and, and Jed, just to add on to that as well. Um, I'd invite you to join the, the crude, and egg, crude Awakening Network that I mentioned earlier. Um, we can get messages out there to see if there are folks in your area who are working on these issues. Um, letters to the editor uh, have actually been used to, to start groups and look out or try to find people, just talk about your concerns and invite people to reach out to you. Um, and then you can reach out to groups like us or Earthworks or, or the Center for Sustainable Economy. Uh, Barry mentioned, you know, the national groups, but there's a whole lot of different groups out there who might be able to connect you with folks in your community um, and help get you moving that way. Yeah, and to follow up on, on what Matt is talking about, you could um, speak at a sort of traditional public forum, like a lot of city councils and county commissions have public testimony time. And so even just kind of like asking some questions in that public forum, sometimes they're televised, you know, you can, you can get that. Um, schools tend to be good places to think about this. So anybody who has children usually are concerned about risks. And so that can be like, trying to figure out teachers are aware of this kind of stuff, teachers unions, um, the PTA is a good place. Um, neighborhood association meetings is another good place to kind of see if there are people there. Uh, and then I also like the idea of letters to the editor. So just kind of like think about what are the traditional public fora where people communicate in your community and just sort of like put it out in those spaces. Hey everybody, uh, <laughs> I think one of our, this is the interactivity, it's the other side of it. We had somebody bring their, um, they're trying to connect, I think, uh, Helen, that you're accidentally sharing your screen <laughs> with us, so I'm trying to figure out how to shut that down, um, uh, but <laughs> I'm having a little trouble doing that. Here, I'm going to try to bring up Nick's slides here for a second. Okay, um, so we did have, if we can squeeze in one more question from Roberta who has been waiting patiently, I'm gonna try to uh, bring in Roberta and um, give me just a second to do that. And then, um, and then we'll go ahead and um, wind it down for today. All right, we'll see if we can get Roberta's video. And Hi, is that Roberta? Hello. Hey, Roberta, great. Hi, thank you so much. I just have a quick question. I was wondering if, um, if the ordinance that, the zoning ordinance that was passed in Portland, if there is um, language that can be shared uh, and potentially you know, can be replicated across uh, the nation. Um, so that's question number one. And then the other question that I had was for Mark. I was wondering if he was aware of any possible um, new um, fossil fuel infrastructure um, that um, is planned to be built in the Bay Area, California. So let me just jump in to say that the documents will be sent around so you'll be able to take a look at, at what was used in Portland. And so just because we're low on time, maybe um, if Matt wanted to weigh in on um, things that you might know of in the Bay Area, anybody else knows things that might get a, a, a real run on infrastructure applications in the, in the near term. And several of you are muted. So um, panelists, let me, uh, there we go. We can hear you, Daphne. And yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, on the, on the Bay Area question, right now, one of the big uh, 
upcoming issues. It's already started moving forward in, in what they call the scoping process for the environmental impact report is um, the Phillips 66 has proposed a new marine terminal. Um, the purpose of this marine terminal would be to bring in, I think it's around 60 or 70 more ships a year um, that would be filled with tar sands crude from uh, Canada which uh, both present spill risk as well as emissions risks that impact the communities there. Um, so uh, of, of the things that are on the books right now, that Phillips 66 uh, project in the Bay Area is probably the number one concern. Um, associated with it, it's not exactly uh, extreme oil per se, but the Bay Area Air Quality Management District is also considering um, caps on emissions from all the refineries in the area um, that's going to be a fight that we're engaging in for months to come. Um, and so if, if you reach out to us at STAN um, or to the folks at Communities for a Better Environment um, or Asia Pacific Environmental Network, we can plug you in wherever you, you feel like you fit best in order to, to work on those issues. Thank you. Okay, great. With that, um, I just want to invite any closing thoughts from our panelists. And, uh, and thank them again for, um, for all the prep and, and all of their work and thank the audience for being here today. But I wanna invite um, any closing thoughts from uh, panelists. Yeah, I'd just like to thank everybody for, for uh, viewing this today and uh, re realizing how important it is that we get the word out that we can do things locally that can affect climate change and, and affect our environment in a very positive way. So I just encourage everyone to use all the tools they have in their toolbox to, uh, to do the things that are right for, you know, for our environment. So thank you all for having me as well. Yeah, there's a lot of us fighting this now. Um, sometimes it doesn't seem like it, but we get an indication of how many people are involved in this struggle from time to time. Um, the Vancouver oil terminal has a process that's ongoing and something like 270,000 people submitted comments or something like that uh, in an opposition to the terminal at one point. And so it's like, sometimes you see how many people are there. So there are a lot of us and we are trying to find these solutions. Now we don't have all the answers and the political groundwork is always shifting, but I mean, we're, I think we're in a really good position. Um, we're starting to develop the resources, groups like STAND and CSE and others are like, figuring out how to share those resources and we really want to help. So like, let us know how we can help. And the more and more places that we put this, these types of regulations in place, the better off we're going to be and we can get that renewable energy economy that we all want. Yeah, I would just add the antidote to despair is activism and it's also where you meet the best people. So, you know, once you get engaged in these, struggles you'll find you're surrounded by amazing human beings that care a lot about your community and about the future of the planet and um, as much as it seems that uh, things are going crazy at the federal level we really can uh, work with our elected officials locally and have an impact and that ultimately trickles up to uh, to national and global impacts so hope we can get everybody on this call engaged we need all of you and for and that's wonderful, Daphne. And and that ties into my final comment. Is actually I want to answer a question uh, from Emily Ferguson. Um, she asks, "How do you convince members of your local community to get involved and give them the confidence that there's a possibility of success?" Um, and my answer to that is, we've got a bunch of examples of success. Um, I can point you to uh, the article I mentioned earlier from Zari Herji, but um, come join us on the Crude Awakening Network calls um, for years two or three years now, we've usually led a call with a recent success that somebody's had. Um, in and around the country, there's 20 some uh, oil train terminals that have been stopped. There are pipelines that have been stopped. Um, there are other facilities and uh, proof of concept is out there, you know, where, where people organize and work together in communities and work with their local elected fit officials, we can win on this stuff. Um, so reach out and let's talk. Terrific, everybody. With that, I'm going to ask our panelists to um, stay put for just a minute because we do have a couple questions that we'll try to get to, um, and they'll be part of the recording, though not part of the live event. Um, and so um, I see our audience members um, uh, closing down their links, so thank you all so much, and I will um, close.
go ahead and close down your link um, if you haven't gotten to it first. And uh, thank you all so much for being here today. So let me just see if there are any questions that we didn't get to. There are a couple we didn't get to that we want to chat about now. We had um, uh, somebody asked if the, um, for Nick, if the white paper could be used as the basis for a national referendum. I'm just gonna run these by you and, you, and we can see which ones we wanna ask. Um, Let's see, um, there's a question. Uh, during our fight against the coal terminal, the proponents hired a political land use black ops company named Saint Consulting. Their goal was to create, <laughs> oh, and Barry, you're on mute. I just noticed. Their goal was to create faux support. Our council was basically told not to study research or talk about the project by the county attorney. Will the new study look at that issue? Because other councils have talked specifically about projects like this. Um, so there's a question about dealing with black ops and um, and uh, council people getting told that they can't discuss. Um, there's the question about using the white paper for a national rep referendum. Let me just see, does anybody want to jump in on either of those? Well, I, I can jump in on the, the, the can't discuss portion, but not the black ops part of that. But uh, we were we were bound by uh, when we were running in 2013, we were bound by uh, kind of the Appearance of Fairness Act uh, in that we would have ended up, the council would have ended up being uh, quasi-judicial in the decision whether or not the coal terminal could go in. Uh, and we were, we were told that, you know, we, we can't talk about that uh, at all because you are now entering into that ex parte communication with either the pro side or the con side. So we were stuck for a long time for until 2016 when we got into our comp plan, uh, and and once the tr the lamination had uh, gotten the favorable ruling from the Army Corps of Engineers, we felt we were able to talk about it, and we proceeded, you know, last summer to start being able to publicly discuss. But that was very frustrating for us, uh, always being told by our our county attorney that we can't discuss it. So um, we just had to wait it out until. Uh, there, it, the, the situation and the, and the circumstances presented themselves that we could move forward without risk of being uh, uh, in, in contradiction with that Fairness Act. Just one, one thing to add on to that, the uh, appearance of fairness doctrine that Barry's referring to is a Washington state law, and every state will have some different version of that. In this case, um, the legal advice that was offered to our county council uh, was deeply flawed. Um, yeah. In particular, from the analysis of my dad, the lawyer in my family who helped create the Appearance of Fairness Doctrine uh, 40 some years ago. Um, so it, uh, this, this is one of the games they play and there's unquestionably uh, communication from the other side to counsel to the council. Uh, and in part through groups like uh, St. Consulting, the Calvert Street Group, there's others out there who are working to direct the lobbyists, uh, creating the appearance of local support, um, trying to restrict turnout at different uh, community meetings, uh, actively pr physically preventing people from going to community meetings uh, in a couple of the towns here. Um, so if, if that stuff happens, uh, by all means, reach out to your, your national groups and your next you know, favorite lawyer like Nick. Um, and we'll work to see what we can uh, do to deal with those folks. Yeah, um, with shenanigans, I mean, they're going to happen all the time. It's just because there's so much money on the line that people are going to play with whatever boundaries they can, and you just work through it. And when you identify those tactics, you, you know, combat them however you can. So I'm not sure I have a ton of advice there. Um, the um, um, question about the national referendum Again, yeah, it's, was, uh, can we use the white paper as a basis for a national referendum? Um, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure what's meant by that. In a formal sense, we can't do referendums on a national level. Um, we don't have an initiative process in the federal government like some states do. Uh, too bad. Um, might be fun. But that um, 350 contracted with me to write that so that they could share it. They, they want people to see that and they want people to sort of 
see that there are ways in which their communities, wherever they are, can take some of the lessons that we have and try to apply them in their communities. So as an author, I'm perfectly fine with people like taking the lessons and trying to communicate them elsewhere. Um, and maybe if there are like more specific questions or clarifications about what a national referendum means actually that um, PM Thomas could like email me or something like that and tell me in greater detail what he means.